Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dichi. Today, I'll be talking about uh, the title is Syntax Generate Operations Reflective Verified. So the talk will be kind of divided into two parts. First part, I will introduce what is Syntax Generate Operations. And the second part, I'll talk about what does mean Reflective Verified. OK. So first of all, maybe there's something uh, a lot of people are very f familiar with. It's uh, language and language. So typically, we will define a programming language in a depending type programming language, like Agda. So we have ty here. It's uh, the possible type of the term. And with a list of contacts, a context is a list of ty. And we have a relation that's a, that's a has relation. And the language we have here is a simply type lambda calculus. So each constructor of this uh, type corresponds to a, a construction as long as a typing rule. For example, variable, the variable rule, the application rule, and the abstraction rule. Now, uh, this definition is uh, the, int the intrinsic typing uh, provides a scope safe definition. So everything defined in this language is well typed by definition. Okay, and now we can define some function on this uh, definitions. For example, a rename function. Rename function is also scope safe. A rename says that if, if there's a variable mapping from everything in gamma to everything in delta, then we can acquire another mapping. So every every term that's typed in gamma is also typed in delta. And the rename here uh, follows a very simple rule. So basically, if you take a term that's constructed from the variable rule, you we get a term that is also constructed with the variable rule, but we just apply the rename function on it, uh, of the, the remapping function. Okay, and if for if there's a subturn in a turn, then we apply rename recursively. So, uh, however, we want to extend the object language further. Here, for example, we want this language to express turns with the type of natural numbers. And so we have two rules, like zero and suck, f to construct types of natural number. And we also add two, another two rules, one is for branching and one is for uh, recursion. We also have to extend the rename function. So the, you can, maybe you can see a pattern here, right? Uh, for every constructor in the language we define, we need to add a close to the rename function. And the definition of that close are also very similar. So for example, uh, it it's follows basically the same logic as the last definition. Uh, the constructed turn share the same constructor with the turn is constructed from. And uh, if you encounter a subturn, you call rename recursively. And if there's a, a context extension, for example, the uh, abstraction case in the last example, or the mu here, you need to extend the remapping function so the De Bruyne index still match. Now, if we extend even further, you can see it becomes a very repeating work. We added so many rules here, and the rename function needs uh, another bunch of uh, definitions. But so here's the repetition, right? We don't want to define. Uh, we don't want to redefine the rename function every time uh, we redefine or extend the object language we're working in. So the, to make things worse, that's not the only repeating operation. So we have substitution. We have printing. We have scope checking, and maybe we have type checking. But all this has to be redefined every time this, your object language is redefined or extended. So today we'll be talking about uh, two, mainly, mainly two parts. First of all, I will talk about uh, some works people have done to uh, elim eliminate such repetitions. And there's our version of uh, our version of their work that share another process of eliminating such repetitions. And we will make some comparisons uh, along the way. And most, of, most importantly, uh, we would like to hear from you what you think about it and how, uh, 
what's the pros and cons of the method we're using. Now, first of all, um, let's introduce some syntax generation operations people have defined. Um, so there are a lot of this kind of libraries. And fortunately, um, I think Andreas from the last session also introduced this paper that is a work from ILI. Uh, sorry, <laughs> maybe you're pronouncing wrong, sorry. But uh, in this work, uh, basically they provided a universe that is the syntax universe. So I won't go into the details here, but basically every inhabitant in this universe represent as language. So simply type lambda calculus we introduce can be represented by the disk data uh, by the disk desk universe we introduce here, um, and you can see it's parameterized by uh, by a types i, which is the uh, type of the object language you are defining. So when I write when I use universe desk i, or in this case desk ty, it basically says uh, every inhabitant in this universe is a syntax that every turn has a type ty, and also uh, it has a context that's list of ty. Uh, what can we do with this, un with u this universe? So uh, of, first of all, we can see after we described uh, a simply type lambda calculus with this universe, we can use an operation tm to get something that's structurally very similar to the native data type we just defined. And um, we can also prove, uh, maybe provide some isom uh, uh, isomorphisms between them. And we can define generic name function after that. So you can see here, the uppercase semantics is what they are used, what they use to describe uh, generic functions. And you can see in this case, renaming, in renaming, D is quantified. So for everything in a universe disk I, there is a, a generic function description for renaming. And in this, so in this case, uh, the small case semantics is used to acquire the real generic uh, renaming function. And you can see the type of it says that for every D, there is a, um, Rename function from T and D to another T and D, so it looks similar to the rename function we defined earlier, and but it's generic. It works for every D in desk I, so we don't have to. Uh, def it, once we uh, define, encode the syntaxes in this universe, we can use the generic functions they provide. So generic, yeah, that's generic function semantic records and they are realized via semantics. Okay. Now, um, we say to rescue, but I haven't said anything wrong. There's nothing wrong about the approach, but I think we can sh I can share with you that how our approach work, and maybe we can see what's the difference between them. So um, it's, a, it's a advertisement time. <laughs> we have another talk at ICFP, it's Tuesday. And in this talk, we introduce a way to uh, combine data type generating programming and elaborate reflection, such that um, data type data type generating programs are programs that work work on a family of data types. For example, uh, with um, initiality, we know that there is a fold for every data type in ECTA, or maybe inductive data type in ECTA. And we can define programs that work for family data types. What does this have to do, to, to do with syntax generating operations? It turns out syntax generating operations are data type generating operations, but with constraints, because the syntaxes we just defined can be seen as a subset of all the inductive data types. So what's the process here? We can, we, let, let's, let me show you a, pro a process a programmer would do to uh, ratify the generic programs we defined in our library. First of all, they define a native data type T, so they don't have to use uh, the generic encoding. So they, they don't have to, to redefine their syntax in a generic universe. 
And then they use the meta program which we provide to generate the data type description D of T. Then they can choose the description, a program description from a set of predefined general programs. Now there's another meta program that takes D and P and generates the native function. So by generating native function, I mean the meta program would generate a function that looks almost exactly like something you would define by hand. So it's a native function defined on native data types. It would, uh, the programmer doesn't need to uh, understand the uh, description of a generic function. But the process we just defined is actually not, not enough. It only works when the program we are saying, we are describing, is actually work for all kinds of data types. But in this case, we only uh, want program that works for a subset of data types, that is the syntaxes. So we will further define a predicate, S on D, that says T is indeed a syntax. So the predicate is defined on uh, the data type description. So we can uh, constrain saying that a subset of that description are actually uh, the syntax is we, we want. Now let's uh, do the rundown again, but with our actual definition, the user defines a language called lamb, and you can see it has a type and list of type. And it call, they, they call a gen data D meta program that generates the data type description. And now the programmer uh, are required to define uh, or provide a proof that's called syntax that says lamb D is actually a syntax. And here is the generic library they will be using. So by calling the renaming is, is another generic program description. So it's very similar to the description uh, we introduced that's defined by a light at L. Uh, and it would, it will, uh, it would, the function will provide us a semantics. But um, the semantics they generate are syntax generic, generic operations. But the, the, the meta programs we have is something that turns data type generic operation into uh, native functions. So we need another function that translates syntax generic operation to uh, data type gen generic operations. Then we can use the meta program define fold because we find we f we found out that all semantics are actually folds, um, and define fold can ratify this uh, fold uh, fun fold function described by fold p to native functions. So the, this rename function here, once the programmer um, use our general library, they they, they can get a rename function exactly uh, exactly type like this. So they don't have to uh, redefine rename function every time they redefine a new language. So in, in that work, the, the, the data type description and generic program, data type generic program descriptions are defined in that work uh, as, well as, the, as well as the data meta programs. But in this work, um, we modified that a little bit. So we define a predicate syntax that says something, a uh, what subset of the data type, uh, data type description are actually syntax. Um, we also have a function that translates the generic program to data type generic program for P. Uh, I don't think we have time to get into the details of syntax here, so let's just skip it. But um, there's a something concerns us when we were de developing this framework. That is how complicated is the proof of syntax. So we have a language here, PCF. Um, it, has, it has five constructors. Um, how do we know this data type is actually um, a syntax we want? It turns out uh, the syntax proof is pretty uh, straightforward. Yes, um, most of them are just equality proofs, and they can just be filled with the refl constructor in Agda. So maybe this proof can be generated by meta programs, but 
or we have done yet. Now let's do a quick quick discussion. Uh, I don't think we have a lot of time for this. So, uh, do we really need <laughs> generating uh, syntax generated libraries? Maybe it's kind of uh, maybe people actually don't really want to use syntax generated library at all. Then what we have done is not uh, really that necessary. Maybe you know people don't want to spend time. Uh, looking for what kind of general library they can use on their syntaxes. Maybe they only define new language once in a time, so they don't have to uh, keep redefining it and keep calling a new, uh, gen they don't need general library to reduce the reputation um, they'll be facing. But that's what, that's what concerns us, maybe uh, people here who will be using this kind of things can tell us what do you think uh, that's uh, my that's my talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.